Thanks for downloading show 129 of the C-Suite podcast that we're recording in partnership with Finson Technologies. My name is Russell Goldsmith and the discussion in this episode is about how we get the workplace functioning safely again, giving uh, employees confidence to return now that COVID-19 restrictions are starting to be lifted. Uh, Joining me online to talk through their experiences of the last 12 months and share their learnings and some of the plans they have in place are Mark Husband, Corporate Environment Health and Safety Manager at Dover Fueling Solutions. Solutions. Um, Mark is based in Dundee, Scotland. And then from Maryland in the US is Petter Raba, uh, Vice President Meetings and Events Global Operations at Marriott International, uh, meaning we have representatives from manufacturing and the hospitality sectors. Uh, also on the call is Bill Passmore, Chief Executive Officer of our partners for this episode, Finson Tech Group, um, who specialise in the design and manufacture of UVC disinfection products. And so we'll be hearing about how Finson's products are being effectively utilised across both Mark and Petter's industries, but also across healthcare too. And finally, as Bill focuses on UVC, we'll also hear from Dr. Tina Joshi, lecturer in molecular microbiology at the University of Plymouth, who I caught up with recently to find out a little bit more about the science behind how UVC technology works and how effective it is against COVID-19 and other viruses. So as always, lots to get through. Bill, let's come to you first. Um, Why were you so keen to bring these guys together and have this conversation now? Well, thanks very much, Russ. Um, yeah, we're very keen to engage with uh, with industry, get their perspectives, get the different perspectives um, wider than than healthcare. We we as a business are engaged in healthcare on a daily basis, um, but uh, of course, getting the workplace back um, back to n- normality, getting footfall in through um, businesses, looking after employees, etc. Um, within industry manufacturing is extremely important. So to get Petter's uh, and Mark's perspective on the wider aspect, um, of course, born in healthcare, but everybody um, conducts healthcare everywhere they are, whether they're working, they're playing. Um, and um, you know, just getting back to normal is, is really what we're looking at. Great perspective from Mark and Petter will be valued. Brilliant. Well, let's get to know our, our two guests then, um, their, you know, their businesses and how the past 12 months have been. Mark, we should obviously highlight that um, you are a customer of Finson. But um, first off, can you tell us a little bit about Dover Corp and what the workplace has been like during the pandemic? Because you've got very different environments in, in terms of the workplace, because you've got the office, the shop floor and the, uh, and the factories, of course. Yeah, thanks, Russell. I work for a company called Dover Fueling Solutions, where part of Dover Corporation, who are a publicly listed US company, um, uh, trade on the uh, New York Stock Exchange, and uh, our part of the business, Dover Fueling Solutions, concentrates on uh, retail petroleum and manufacturing, particularly of petrol pumps and associated equipment on the forecourt, such as gauging, levelling equipment, point of sale systems, uh, digital wet stock monitoring, and a variety of other uh, different aspects of, of downsteering retail fueling. Um, our headquarters are Dover Fuel Institutions in Austin, Texas, but our European headquarters is here in Dundee, where we have a large manufacturing centre that employs about 500 direct uh, staff, and uh, then you have supporting engineering and, and finance and other functions that, that come into that uh, office space. Um, and yeah, wh- what a year it's been. It's, uh, it's really been learning how to deal with a pandemic. And becoming a pandemic expert when you knew nothing really about it before has been a huge learning curve. Uh, like you alluded to, we have a real mix of direct labour workforce, a shop floor, with support staff, of engineering groups. Um, we have remote employees. Uh, we also have leadership teams that, that, that sit in the site as well. So we had to, to adapt very quickly uh, to, to not only local government guidance, but we also had to adapt to our corporate uh, requirements. So our, our, our corporate team put together a package of response measures that each site should uh, should really be looking to, um, to to meet and we were part of actually that building process so the, the site here in, in Dundee we've had a long history of, of being um, a safety minded company uh, our product that goes onto the, the pedal forecourt has to to meet some pretty strict safety uh, safety requirements and as such and you're dealing with petrol and petrol retail we've had a uh, safety as a core value for a number of years at Dover Fueling Solutions and I think that that stood us in good stead in the pandemic and in the beginning of, of, of trying to learn how to live with COVID. Um, we, we of course had to send immediately everybody home when lockdown hit uh, here in, in, in Scotland and over the next four or five days we then found out we could reopen again. We were a, an essential business supplying 
the fueling and transport sector. So we had to quickly uh, COVID proof the, uh, the, the, the factory. So we had a variety of measures we had to put in there, um, including your distancing, your stickers, you know, enhanced hygiene measures. Um, and we, we, we then had to try and uh, safely bring people back into the workplace, which we, we had to go over a number of different aspects there. People's reluctance to come back into work, people's fear of the pandemic, you know, people, people acting very irrationally about things that, that you know, normally they would have been fine with. Um, and, and the flip side of that as well, we had a whole um, part of our business that, that were just immediately sent home in a temporary working from home situation. You had to suddenly work out how to do their job sitting in their house on their sofa or, you know, it, you yeah. talk about ergonomics of, of seating and things like that when people are sitting on a, a kitchen stool or, you know, with people that were living in like a one bedroom bed set. Um, and, and we had to deal with the mental health side of that as well as the mental health of the people that were, were, were coming in. So it was a mixture of physical and mental health challenges that we um, that, that we came across as well as having to learn, you know, about a pandemic, about how, uh, how viruses spread, about, you know, teaching people to not touch their face or their nose or their, their mouth when that had been something that had been normalized to for years. You know, we, we really had a, had a, a, a few real uh, steep learning curves that we, um, that we had to go through. Um, and, and it was great leaning on other parts of the, the Dover corporate. You know, they, they've got 27 different, different operating companies under Dover Corporation. And there's a wealth of experience from, you know, industrial hygienists to, you know, people that have dealt with chemical weapons before in, in, a, in a military sense. So we had, had a lot of different experience that we could tap into that kind of improved the, uh, the overall COVID safe program that we were putting into our sites here in Dundee, as well as the other sites around the globe. So um, it, it's been it's been a phenomenal year, um, uh, you know, dealing with everything from physical health challenges to really like that, that mental health piece, which I'm, I'm quite passionate about myself. I'm a mental health first leader, and touch on it a little bit later. But it's been something that we've really um, stepped up our game in the last year in in terms of supporting people's mm -hmm. mental health and really understanding people's um, people's challenges when it comes to dealing with a pandemic plus your your mental health on top of it. Yeah. A lot of stuff to, to think about and and and, uh, and manage. I mean, Petter. For, I mean, obviously, listeners, you know, would assume would be a little bit maybe more familiar with Marriott as, as a business. But I mean, hospitality has been hugely impacted. First of all and foremost, Bill and, and Russell, thank you for having me here today. It's a, it's a great to be here with you. Uh, you are absolutely right. I mean, uh, business in in our seven thousand plus hotels has been impacted dramatically. I mean, we, we started earlier uh, in the beginning of uh, last year in China, obviously, where we shut down majority of our hotels. And then we continued uh, the impact in, in our Asia Pacific region and then move into Europe, uh, Middle East and Africa, and then to United States. So, so, you know, majority of our hotels have been closed. Uh, if hotels have been opened, they have been running below 10% occupancy and uh, all the meeting space and all the restaurants have been closed. So unfortunately, we had to uh, put a lot of our employees on furlough. And, and then moving forward, unfortunately, we need to resize some of the operations in our hotels. So we had to uh, go uh, let go some of our, our employees. You know, for me personally, uh, I had the great pleasure to start a new job. So I moved in uh, in the middle of March from Asia Pacific, from Hong Kong, from one pandemic into another one in the United States. And I started uh, started a new job. So I, I, I highly recommend to try this experience for somebody to start a new job in the, in during pandemic. Uh, but it was great learning for us. It was great learning. And, you know, what was very important that all the continents and all the hotels were pulling together to make sure that we come out of this very strong. So first thing first, what we did, we focus on cleanliness in, in our business, making sure that when we welcome our guests back to our hotels, our hotels are super clean. So what we did together with our internal experts as well with our external experts, we had a, a panel of uh, microbiologists, we had a science uh, professionals to help us to put together a, a protocols for our hotels, what they need to do as they reopen. So we called commitment to clean. So commitment to clean really for us uh, is a guidance for the hotels, how they should clean their hotels as they welcome 
our uh, guests back, ensuring that we do our due diligence and, and keep our employees and our guests safe. So commitment to clean is basically 10 standards that we put together with our experts, what the hotels needs to do moving forward. You know, year in into this, I think, you know, we are in a much better shape. We do some green shoots in, in our business. Obviously China is, is going back to regular business. Europe and, and United States are slowly but surely coming back where we see the occupancies rising up. And with that, again, we can bring some of our uh, employees back to our hotels and, and bring them back to our jobs. Are you in a slightly different situation because your where your workplace is the same as is the same place as where your your guests are staying? So you know you're dealing with both there, aren't you? In terms of confidence of bringing guests in, but also people working in in that environment at the same time. Absolutely, and that's why we want to make sure that we you know protect our our guests and 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 our uh, employees. You know, so that's why we have these high standard protocols that we put in place, and and some of them starting with really a basics. You know, uh, make sure you wash hands uh, frequently. You know, make sure you wear masks. So again, Marriott was one of the first hotel chains that implemented mask mandates in 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 the business. So absolutely, we want to make sure as we bring those back, that applies for both guests and, and our associates, more importantly. Right. Mark, what, what other things, you touched on a few things as, you know, it, it, as you were just explaining, you know, what's, what the year's been like. What other things have you put in place to create that kind of safe environment? Yeah, we, we went through a, a process where we created a COVID-19 playbook. It's a uh, playbook term has been used in our operational excellence um, side of our business for quite a while, but the playbook itself was a, a, a guide in how you could successfully COVID uh, proof your, your business. And uh, we created that in conjunction with our parent company, uh, Dover Corporate, and uh, it, it touched on everything from, you know, distancing employees from each other, putting up physical barriers, uh, identifying high touch areas, um, putting in sanitizing regimes, uh, putting in um, physical hygiene uh, regimes, uh, segregating everything from creating a space between every other car in the car park to, to, to give a distance from there right the way through to, you know, urinals and, and then toilet cubicles being, being put out of action to allow, to allow for, for, for space. Um, we, we investigated a number of different um, uh, products and services to help us with our, our sanitization because it was one of the things that we really felt we needed to have a strong game on um uh, initially we we had a look at yeah through our, our cleaning company using different uh, sanitizing products and uh, we went through a number of different gels and sprays and cleaning cloths and materials and we moved from then on to a sanitizing fog that we we uh, used in the building uh, here in Dundee and it was used on a reactive measure and a proactive measure so reactively we were san using the sanitizing fog uh, so reactively we were using the sanitizing fog every time we would have a case or somebody who was symptomatic thereafter their area or the common areas would be uh, the sanitizing fog used on it we were also doing it proactively every six weeks we were using uh, the, the fogging company to go through the entire building and uh, and, and fog it the, the the downside to that is though that you you can't really see the fog you, you can't really smell the fog nobody was able to to, to tangibly like, have any effect from the from the fog uh, although we we tell people there is a cloak of safety here it's in there uh, and and you know that was part of a reason for for looking into alternative um uh, hygiene tools and uh, our parent company dover uh, had, had got in contact with us to say they had a you know they had found a sanitizing robot and i thought this was fantastic you know i thought i had the idea of a roomba uh, kind of machine going around and and sanitizing my uh, my factory space for me but um but then we uh, we, we entered into uh, discussions with bill at at, at Finson and Find out uh, what the what UVC robot was, and that was a game changer for us. It was something that we were able to, you know, physically take and implement and 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 uh, put around our factory floor and give people a real confidence boost. Um, but yeah, that was one of our, uh, our, our our tools that we had. We we also had to um, had to completely revamp the way that we operated in our factory. It did put a complete distancing process in where we 
we, we looked at the flow of our materials coming onto the production lines, going up to the finishing areas, loading them onto trucks. And the, the way that we, we laid out our, our facility, it's a, it's a large facility, we had to completely revamp that from material coming into material leaving and putting a complete one-way system into the site where people and materials could move in a singular route to try and limit the spread, which is, uh, look at different ways to ventilate the, the facility because we're used to forced ventilation so we had to had to change that and uh, adapting fire doors to, to make them into ventilation doors and working out angles where wind could come through uh, uh, at one end of the building going to the other all those sort of things were were, were headaches to begin with the things we we managed to overcome yeah, and true to say you got involved in many things you never dreamt that you would be getting into um, no. a bit like uh, <laughs> a bit like petter and uh, and russell and myself yeah it, it was bill you know i never thought in all my years i would spend a friday night with hazardous tape taping off a urinal um for for pandemic purposes but it was uh, it, it was astonishing the things we got up to yeah and finding ways i think to give people confidence in your system was one of the, the challenges for us because they had a lot of media uh, out, uh, out there that was sometimes false media, sometimes misinformation. You had people making up their own versions of what you were and weren't allowed to do. I mean, even to the stage of looking at car sharing or using public transport, you know, we, we at one point in time that was frowned upon by the government to get on the bus or, or to share a car. So we had to even go to the stage of linking mm -hmm. up with a local bicycle recycling company and saying, hey, could we make a deal with you to buy recycled bicycle, a helmet and a safety vest? And we'll give that to the people to allow them to come into work safely so they didn't mm -hmm. have to risk getting on a bus or, or, or sharing a car. So it was real and it, it was an end to end spectrum of things that we were looking at. So we just took a pause there because um, Mark needed to move into another room because it was getting a bit noisy in his office there. But um, Mark, you, you were just saying about, um, you know, in, investing in, in one of the UBC robots. How, how have you actually used that in, to, in the actual uh, factory floor then? We found it extremely beneficial, uh, Russell. It's been, it's been an incredible piece of kit to bring onto the site. We, we've deployed it both in a proactive and a reactive sense. Um, reactively, in the event of any cases or any suspected cases, we have a positive case protocol that we roll out every single time, and that involves the sanitization of that person's work area, their tools, and any common areas that that person might have been in. Um, so we, we found that we could use the UVC uh, robot for that. We have also used it uh, proactively. We scoped out the factory into different zones, which we marked on the floor with stickers, and those stickers were numbered, and that number associated itself with the chart, uh, and a logbook. So you could then, at the end of every evening, you could take the UVC robot, put it down on that area, uh, plug it in, set it up, and uh, and have it do its uh, do its work while you were uh, off site. Then in the morning, they will come in, they take the robot, they put it into the safe storage area for it, and they mark off on the logbook that that area has been done that evening. So it was a way of working into our. We had a two shift pattern. Uh, in, the, in this factory, we have a day shift and a, and a back shift, and the back shift ends at half past one in the morning. So between half past one in the morning and uh, seven o'clock when, when people restart again, we were able to then do individual different segments of the shop floor area. Therefore, over a small amount of time, you can do the entire factory floor uh, in, a, in a regular sanitizing. Great. Bill, just listening to what, what Mark had to say there, I mean, obviously within factories, there's a huge amount of floor space and, and full of you know, equipment that, you know, might be typically difficult to, to uh, disinfect. How can we be sure that such areas are being cleaned efficiently with UVC? Well, with our particular technology, we've, we've encompassed a number of different, um, different aspects. Uh, for example, we, um, we have military specification LIDAR, which is kind of light and, light and ranging, um, effectively radar that measures the room to millimeter accuracy. Not only does it uh, measure the room, it measures the contents, the size, the shape, and the position of the contents as well. So it then takes all of those into account and it will actually decontaminate very efficiently, probably a 10 meter by 10 meter space, and then you move to another. So you can actually do it in a segmented approach um, and you can then work that around a workflow aspect like Mark's alluded to. You've always got people coming in and out um, of a space. So therefore you, uh, in these new post-pandemic times, you're going to be looking to have a new protocol of working and people will adopt this uh, as, as part of their, their daily regime. The, the fact is we can do, with our particular products such as Thor, we can do small, small spaces such as cupboard up to an auditorium size. So it's about having that completely recorded, 
making sure from a health and safety point of view that we've also got um, uh, that recording put into the cloud so we know who's operated it, where, when, how long, how strong. And we have a number of other initiatives and products coming up as well, because Thor not only cleans the surfaces, but it cleans the air at the same time. So we have that aspect. And we also have other products that are still also on the Internet of Things connected and they put reports into um, the infection control professionals uh, inbox, if you like, at making sure that we're talking about the air integrity in an event or a meeting room or, uh, or, or the cafeteria where, where staff go. And it's interesting we've actually got uh, the two gentlemen today because they represent exactly the two areas over and above healthcare of, of industry in, in the world. So effectively, we've got huge employers where we have a lot of people coming to work in, in, in an industrial space, a manufacturing space, an office space. And also you've got the business to customer relationship that Peter um, has with uh, his, his end user, because that's about confidence. That's about getting people coming back into that um, meeting hall, that, uh, that hotel, um, that environment, the event, the gym at, uh, at Marriott, for argument's sake. And, you know, we've got that confidence level has to be built by the end user, with the end user. And then that means that they come back into the facility and it, it, it generates an upward spiral as opposed to the downward spiral that we've been experiencing lately, or in fact, just the dead stop that we've all encountered. Sure. Well, it's probably a good time to hear from uh, Dr. Tina Joshi then. As I mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Joshi is a lecturer in molecular bi uh, microbiology at the University of Plymouth. Um, and as I want to understand a little bit more about the science behind UVC technology, uh, when we spoke, I started by asking her to explain how UVC disinfection works from a microbiological perspective, but also why it's um, effective against COVID-19 and other viruses. UVC is a type of ultraviolet light. It's a, it's in the electromagnetic spectrum and it exists between x-rays and visible life, lights that's between 100 nanometers and 400 nanometers the uvc that we're interested in is highly germicidal that is actually between 200 and 300 nanometers and what that actually does is it actually disinfects bacteria and viruses and other microorganisms in a really really simple way it disrupts their nucleic acids so that's their dna and their rna and that in effect makes them or renders them ineffective so they can't do what they intend to do, which is infect people. Um, and their cellular, fun cellular functions also are disabled whenever we use UVC light. So it's an optimal way of disinfecting. Viruses are really interesting because they aut autonomously replicate and they're acellular. So that means that they're technically not alive. Um, and the thing is about UVC light, what that will do is when it actually enters a virus or the virus is succumbing to it, it will damage the nucleic acids in the virus's core. So that could be the DNA or RNA. In the case of coronavirus, it is RNA that's damaged. And that means the virus can't continue to replicate. That means it, its life cycle can't continue. And thus the UVC will work. So it stops it from actually doing what it wants to do, which is, again, get into a host and infect that host. So it's really optimal to disinfect COVID-19 with UVC light. What about as the virus mutates? For the current variants of COVID-19, the mutations are within the RNA genome. And the thing is about UVC light, that will not have any effect on the way that the virus mutates. The UVC itself will damage the RNA, no matter whether it's got a mutation or not. So it's no, no actual consequence to actual UVC use if the virus has a mutation or not. Are there any downsides to using uh, UVC? I think the only downside to using UVC is that there should be no humans in the room or, or the place where the UVC is being implemented. But that is only for literally about a minute or two minutes. So the two minutes, you know, you can disinfect a room really, really rapidly. And it's fast, it's effective, it's user friendly, and it's a much better way of disinfecting by hand using chemical substances. So there's only a small uh, you know, disadvantage to using UVC light. And I think that's very, very minor considering the benefits of use, use, using UVC light when compared to biocides and disinfectants like hypochlorites, for example. And the reason for that is, is a lot of bacteria right now have developed resistance to hypochlorites, that's chlorine releasing agents. What that means is, is that it's important we have a viable alternative like UVC light that can actually be used to disinfect these particular bacteria that are able to start resisting disinfectant use. So, uh, Petra, am I, am I right in saying that Maria is using UV technology, but on a, on a 
you know, much smaller scale because um, you, you're using it to clean key cards and, and things like that. Is that right? Yeah, no, Russell, you're absolutely right. Um, I think back in last year, we, we started to look in the UV technology and we did run some of our tests in our hotels. And I know the technology evolved uh, as, as obviously when we went through this pandemic. But our ma major challenge was really uh, the scale, you know, the number of rooms. If you think about hotel with seven, 800 rooms and moving that UV equipment from room to room, which was slightly challenging for us, but we definitely found a solution where we are using the UV technology. So for example, you know, if you come and check into our hotels, you will get a key card. So what we are doing in our hotels, we are using the UV technology that disinfect those, those key card after our guests are, are checking out from our hotels. Now, other things that you've put in place, obviously, you've, you've recently um, released your Connect with Confidence program for customers. Do you want to just talk us through what's involved in that? Absolutely. Thank you. I think, you know, for all what we do, uh, the end goal is instill confidence for our customers to bring them back to our business and bring them back to our meeting spaces. So that was the end goal for us from the very beginning of the pandemic. So after we developed the uh, cleaning protocols, as I mentioned earlier, we moved on and developed a protocols for a meeting and events. So, so for us, we developed Connect with Confidence, which basically maps the entire journey from the customer arrival all the way to the meeting space and to departure. And it really breaks down the entire experience in, in various sections. So you will have pre-event phase. So we talk about various things like a um, contactless arrivals. Then we move into, um, then we move into the check-in. So how do we do check-in uh, in our hotels today where you can uh, register, be our Merit Bon Boy member with that you don't have to go to the desk so you can register and check in without going to the desk and in some of the locations you will be able to use our mobile key where you don't have to have these key cards to get into your room so it, it i guess enables our guests to go into hotel and then use their their mobile phones and then basically put their phone in front of the key in the guest room and that will open your door. So we've been on this for quite some time. Obviously this, uh, this needs a lot of investment from our owners, you know, change their locks to mobile keys. So we are on the journey, you know, to support our digital platforms in our hotels to install all the keys in, in majority of our hotels. Right. And, and, and then on this journey, you know, with connected confidence, you go into a various aspects. So really, uh, the Connect with Confidence program needs to instill confidence to our meeting planners to come back and really focusing on six key pillars, which is the commitment to clean, I mentioned. It's uh, the contactless solutions for our hotels. Uh, then talks about social distancing, reimagined food and beverage. Uh, so a lot of things that we do in our food and beverage today are different. Uh, we're focusing on individual packaging, uh, on more grab and go. You know, buffets, if they are in place, they will have individual sneeze guards. We're making sure that whatever equipment is used by the guests is sanitized and, and exchanged every 20, uh, every 20 minutes. And uh, <clears throat> again, the last piece to, to, to this puzzle is hybrid meetings. You know, hybrid meetings is critically important for our business and what we are trying to do with hybrid meetings, ensuring that we have guests joining in person in our hotels and the rest of them joining them virtually. So we found solution for our meeting planners to host hybrid meetings in our hotels. And last but not least is, is flexible terms. We need to be flexible with our guests, making sure if they book meeting in our hotels, we honor that and be understanding that things might change down the road. So being flexible, critically important for our business. Just coming back on, on a couple of the things you, you said there, what happens if um, attendees are bringing, you know, their own items to, you know, in, into the, the meeting environment? So water bottles, for example, something like that. Or, or if you've got, you know, a typical conference will have a breakout area. You've got all the exhibitor spaces. Quite often, you know, they give away their freebies, the pens or whatever it is that, that they're you know, going to be handing out. Does every, are you going to be focusing on making sure that, those are all sanitized, you know, before reaching the venue? Yes, we do. So typically what applies to our, our own hotels, uh, making sure what comes into a hotel is, is sanitized. 
And we ask all our vendors uh, and our meeting planners as well to follow our protocols as well. So whatever comes in the hotel needs to be sanitized. Uh, we have uh, definitely a lot of sanitizing stations and sanitizing equipment available for our guests. All our uh, water is being bottled. Uh, we, we don't offer a fountains anymore. And if a customer wants to bring in water, they are perfectly fine to do that. Again, as long as they are not sharing it with anybody else. And if they do have uh, things they are giving away, we definitely want to ensure that these items are sanitized. But we see a little bit less of that in today's world where customers will do a lots of giveaways. And if they do, they typically are something that are useful for meetings. So they're giving away masks masks, they are giving away useful items uh, that can be used throughout the conference. Right. And what about, again, going back to one of the other aspects of, of the, um, you know, the Connect with Confidence, the, the food and beverage, um, it, it, how difficult is it going to be managing that supply chain, you know, that food supply chain, um, you know, if, if, for example, a key supplier suffers an outbreak or something like that, you know, is that going to be you know, is that going to be difficult in terms of measuring all, all that and keeping all the safety in place there? Well, we're doing it today, Russell. I mean, some of our hotels are open today. Uh, they run uh, quite quite substantial occupancy and, and they run food and beverage as well. So we are in the business today. We obviously, as I mentioned earlier, asking our uh, vendors to comply right. uh, with our guidelines. And we have a list of preferred vendors that Merit is using that we know uh, that they are safe. And we as well anticipate and that they will inform us if they have any challenges with COVID outbreak. You know, and as, as the food comes into the hotel on, on our entry point to the hotel, we again making sure that all the equipment that is coming to hotel is sanitized. And, um, and then as they go through the operations. Bill, in, in the discussions that, that you've been having, you know, with the hospitality in industry, what challenges have, have they said they're facing, you know, when looking to adopt things that, that you're providing in terms of the UVC technology? Well, I think one of the main things, as we mentioned a little earlier, is that uh, the rooms we want to fill with people. We want to have confidence. We want to have people in those rooms enjoying and working safely. The fact is, of course, if you've got rooms full of people, then you have to kind of logistically manage that. Um, so what we've also done is we've we've brought into into being and we're actually just about to launch some a further range of products where um, you can be using and sanitizing the air on a constant basis with very high level filtration and UVC um, technology whilst people are occupying the spaces um, and we're, we're dealing with large events and large large businesses and gatherings of people if you like so if we can reduce the bio burden in the air, what it means is it mean, it makes the UVC technology such as the robots even more efficient because you can actually reduce the bio burden, therefore less is going to be on the surfaces and in the air at the time. And then we can have, um, uh, if you like, a, a spaced out um, sporadic uh, approach to the, uh, to the UVC decontamination uh, for, the robots coming into the into the space so therefore you can manage the logistics um i think really good point that uh, that Peta raised is uh, with regards to having the integrity throughout your supply chain um marry a, a confidence that um people are having is that you're 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 looking to Marriott and other large suppliers where you spend leisure time and meeting time to manage that safety and compliance throughout the supply chain to that event um, and it's interesting as well that um, whilst we have huge standards in food preparation and food packaging, and then um, also at the, at the hotel end as well, we have to make sure that the transportation, um, often between supermarkets and large um, wholesale, um, wholesale uh, guys, have actually got that um, integrity maintained there. Um, we've found in, in Europe as well that... Uh, you know what, there's no rules and regulations about the sanitation of trucks, um, bringing the food that everybody has diligently managed very, very well to the uh, to the end user who's got fantastic kitchens and, and safety in place. But the fact is the, the trucks need to be part of that. It's the continuum. It's like the, the ISO chain, uh, for argument's sake, where you're dealing with people that you know have got um, strategies in place to look after the integrity of your business as the um, as the purchaser. 
Sure. So it's 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 a it's a community aspect, isn't it? Yeah. And um, Mark, just coming back to you know what your situation and the fact that we talked earlier about the fact that you've got you know office shop floor factory workers has that proved a challenge at all in getting you know how, or, or rather how your teams have felt about coming back to the workplace yeah, i think it's a really good point russell and i think at the beginning of the pandemic you you had a situation where we had to send everybody at home immediately and then we were able to return slowly incrementally and safely the direct workforce the, the the people are actually turning the screws and putting the panels on and doing doing those hands-on tasks and i think at the beginning there was naturally a feeling that the the office workers or the support staff they really had landed on their feet because they didn't have to come back in they didn't have to risk themselves they were safe at home working from home all the time there was there was an aspect of well you know we we might have to come in but you guys are are, are, are kind of safer so a, a lot of our job was centered around giving confidence to people to come into to work and to show them that the workplace was as safe as we could possibly make it and uh, and and we really had to go the extra mile to do that because people naturally were very very scared to to do something that had done for for maybe up to 40 50 years just come into their workplace and and we had a fear element there that we really had to work hard to 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 try and conquer and uh, yeah the the, the people working from home in the beginning probably did feel a little bit safer, but as the time went on and we had subsequent lockdown upon lockdown, I think we went to three possible lockdowns. I think it was, uh, Bill might be able to correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. I think it was three. It's in all the blurred into one, Mark. It's all blurred <laughs> into one. It's just been one, uh, one long uh, sort of a penal sentence almost, hasn't it? It's, uh, <laughs> uh, but these people who have gone to work from home then subsequently mm. probably suffered more because they, they were in a situation where, yes, they were safe in the first instance and they didn't have to get over that coming into work piece. But then they, they, they found a very blurred line between what, when your work ends and your, your home life begins. And naturally, they, they, they got to a stage of, of, of feeling quite frustrated and, and feeling um, probably like their, their mental health suffered more than the people who had to get over initially coming back into work. And so working at that end of it as well, dealing with the mental health challenges of people who have been cooped up in possibly the same room for, for, uh, for a year. Um, that, that previously enjoyed coming into work and you know socializing and mixing with people that, that, that's been interesting and, and quite tough in a different way as well and you know giving people light at the end of that tunnel is very difficult when you don't control the outcome right the outcome's dictated for you by governments or by health advisory bodies so it, it's been different challenges at different times in the pandemic Russell and I do think there was a, a certainly in the beginning a huge the focus of ours was giving people that confidence and things like the UVC technology, investing in, in high-end equipment really gave us that, that, that leverage to say, look, we're not just giving a, a token gesture to COVID-19. We are making some, some investment into, uh, into future tech solutions that are really going to protect this business and protect you and protect your family. Do, do the employees understand that technology, to, does it give them more confidence? I think on a basic level, it's very well understood what it does. I don't, I don't think the very mechanics of it and the science behind it are, are a lot more difficult to understand. And, uh, it, you know, it, as Bill knows from our conversations, I, I, I took a long time to understand exactly how it worked and what it, what it did. And it's really interesting. But I think the main part of what we're doing is giving people confidence. We're saying we're bringing something in that will destroy COVID-19 particles mm -hmm. and and on a very basic level that is that's a huge confidence boost to people and I think I think overall though the the, the system works right um with the UVC technology being part of that system you know the the distancing the mm -hmm. the spacing in the car parks the everything that we we, we talked about the enhanced high hand, hand hygiene the um you know the infection control piece where we we don't take any chances with anybody with symptoms or anybody with positive cases we have our own case management protocol that anybody who has been in contact with somebody who is uh who has possibly got COVID-19 we interview them we make sure we do the contact tracing we don't leave just just up to government or, or health board agencies we can do our own control of that and, and that has resulted in a lot more people being asked to stay off site for maybe 10 or yeah. 14 days. But it is a confidence builder. We're showing to people that, 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 that safety is a core value to us, their safety, their family's safety. And if that means that we then go above and beyond in, in our approach to it, then we're absolutely prepared to do that.
I'll mention something there as well, uh, Russell, and Petha mentioned it earlier as well. Mark um, hit it on the head. It's about the protocol. There's no silver bullet with, with all this. There's no one thing that's going to actually make everything OK again. It's actually a continuum of actions and protocols that we put together. You know, I always use the analogy that, you know, if you buy the equipment, that doesn't solve it. You've got to use it properly. You know, I bought a car. Doesn't mean I can get to the store. The protocol is I get in it. I put the key in the lock. I actually check everything. Then I drive to the store, do my grocery shopping, come back home, put it back in. That's my protocol. The fact is the use has to be there. So it has to be an appropriate protocol. And we're, we work with customers um, on the implementation because Mark's um, implementation will be completely different to how Petal would be looking at it from, from the events and you know, the global, global approach from, from a, a Marriott perspective. Uh, there's an interesting aspect as well, and I think Mark mentioned it, is that um, we've got a lot of people that uh, their, their confidence may be knocked by the fact that there's a lot of Me Too product that come out in the marketplace. Everything that's got a lamp on it um, is now being seen to be you know, disinfecting. Well, Australia has just put in place, you know, it's illegal to say that you've got any kind of sanitation methods with UVC unless you've proven it. You know, same with the EPA and the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. That's about you've got to make sure you can verify your claims. That's about making sure you've got a safe establishment and the, they've been inspected and you can then deliver a product with science backing it to the, to the um, individual and the end users. That's where confidence comes from. And I think if you're using the protocol and you're internally talking to people about, this is what we're doing, then the confidence is pervasive with not only staff, because it starts with our staff and our, and our guys that work with us, our colleagues, and then it moves out and it becomes pervasive within our customer base. And people want to deal with safe, conscientious businesses such as you know dover dover corp uh, fueling solutions and such as um you know marriott where they're in, enacting and bringing in protocols for people's safety and then the confidence happens um i'm going to give you a prime example we we actually were doing some work with um local gyms okay local gyms and guess what as soon as we started doing that they they then started telling in their newsletter not only their staff, more staff are coming back. And we've, we've found that they've instantly improved their membership. They've, they've literally, in the last two weeks, the membership has actually, I won't say quadrupled or anything like that, but there's been a significant uptick in people wanting to get back to exercising safely and going into those environments. And that's exactly where it comes from. Protocol equals confidence equals footfall equals business and back to work. Yeah, B Billy, you're absolutely right. And, you know, what we hear as well from our customers, don't just, just tell us, show us. So, you know, exactly. we want to see how does it, how does it work? So, so what we're doing right now for our customers as well, you know, they said, well, you have a connect with confidence, you have a cleanliness protocols, but that's great. But show us how does it work? What does it mean to host yeah. a meeting in your environment today? So what are we doing with a lot of customers today? We are creating a, a meeting labs, basically, where we're creating vignettes of a, of a event. So we're saying, okay, so if you would come to Marriott, this is your mobile check-in, your, your mm -hmm. mobile. If you would have a food and beverage, this is how the food and beverage will look like. So creating these little pockets of vignettes and inviting our meeting planners to our hotels and showing them. Um, if you host an event in our hotel, this is what it looks like. I mean, it'd be interesting to get different perspectives here, but what's the cost of, of not taking infection control and, and disinfection seriously from, from an employer's point of view? And also, obviously, you're welcoming customers in, into the hotels as, as well and, and guests. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking from kind of like that risk of, of legal action and, and, you know, or is there increased insurance premiums maybe not really for for us i mean obviously for us really uh we are at the highest standards with all of our partners and we typically ask for a fairly a steep liability insurance uh, for anything we do because we have 7500 plus hotels you know so you could imagine if we would have a challenge in one hotel that will affect all of them and more importantly will affect our owners who needs to pay for, for their assets. So, so for us, really, 
uh, not much change in, in this time in terms of liability, really. Making sure that we select the right partners that, that we work with uh, from the very beginning, that's critically important for us. Bill, we've got, let's come to you on this one. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm interesting uh, points, really, because we've, we've actually entered into conversations with uh, insurance companies, and it's interesting. We've found from our own, we're, we're a private equity-backed um, organisation. We're in 40 countries. We engage with probably um, 300 people per day involved in our business. Um, we have direct staff everywhere. The directors and officers insurance in the last 12 months across the board internationally has nearly doubled the cost of that because what they're doing is they're passing the responsibility for the protocols that Mark and Petha have mentioned down to the companies to make sure that they have put that in place so it's safe to come back to work come on back everybody come back to work if it's not safe to come to work and they get something that's covid a workplace associated infection i think there's going to be some new language coming in here as well we have hospital and healthcare acquired infections everybody's heard of those well what about workplace acquired infections and if you haven't got the right protocols and the right um, uh, the right procedures in place then you know, of course, the insurance companies um, will look at. Um, I've never been written to, a, to to by an insurance company who's told me that my premiums are going down and their coverage is going up. I don't know if anybody on this. That'd be uh, nice, wouldn't call it? <laughs> yeah. So therefore, what happens is it's a, basically you, it's always kind of keeping the lid on it, keeping the lid on it, passing and deferring. Um, and I'm saying that from a person that used to be heavily involved in insurance and finance, so we know how this how this kind of thing works. It's passing the responsibility over and making exemptions to the current cover. Um, and I think we've got an opportunity with, with our businesses, two distinct businesses represented here, a business to business, i.e. dealing industrial to ma manufacturing and business to customer, where you're engaging with end users and footfall coming in through your reception, either to meetings or to the hotel um, aspects or leisure. We've got those two areas that um, you know, will be very, very um poignant in in making this happen across the board and insurance companies will be looking at how we react and how our protocols engage safety health and safety you know the the, the clues in the name and they they will use that mark mark thoughts on on that one yeah my thoughts are more around the uh litigious act aspect of this because I, I do think that post pandemic or even now we're, we're, we're hearing rumblings of this that there will be uh, not not particularly for uh, Dover fueling solutions but within the industry in general you've heard rumblings of lawsuits on the back of this and you know people yeah. that that might wish to claim it against their employer for what they perceive to be a workplace transmission of covid that could have been prevented uh, and and I think you will have that that question in in possibly in a court of law or in a civil in a civil court um, you know, was it preventable? Uh, could the business have done more and therefore are they culpable and will they have to then pay some sort of fine uh, or penalty for this? I, I do think post pandemic, you might see uh, a number of different cases coming in, in, in all corners of the world for this kind of thing where businesses maybe have or maybe haven't put in the right protocols in place, but people have then gone on to be infected. And I mm -hmm. think that the burden of proof will be quite difficult because you'd have to prove beyond mostly beyond doubt that you did acquire that infection within the workplace but there will certainly be scrutiny on employers to say well did you do enough did mm -hmm. you do enough and i think that's a that's a big question for for, for some employers out yeah. there no i agree i'm just kind of jumping in again uh, as well and with regards to that you've got the the old scenario certainly in the uk in uk and europe and and of course across uh, across the usa where you have minors pneumoconiosis effectively you know that was a a workplace acquired problem um asbestosis etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i think we've got that uh, that aspect coming in as well the, li the litigation that could come from it and it's not only about coronavirus it's about all other things people are very used to this now they're actually looking at what's the next pandemic what's going to come up next and if we've got a safe, a safe company and a safe um, environment to either work, play, you know, conduct business, have our care delivered, leisure, et cetera, then we're doing, doing the best we can. Um, well, well, well on, that, on that note, Mark, I mean, do you think in terms of like looking towards the future, has, the, has this particular pandemic had an impact on 
behavior change that, that will change permanently for you know going forward but you know you know what's the what's the office and, and factory environment going to look like for you moving forward first of all the pandemic preparedness going forward i think it has much bettered us particularly us uh, ehs professionals to do ready ourselves for a pandemic and hopefully for future pandemics although they're maybe not going to be exactly like covid19 i think we're in a much better place to understand how we respond and what measures we need to put in place and how quickly we need to do that as well. Um, and I'd hope a, a country and, and, and global level countries have themselves had a bit of a wake up call to just how quickly you have to react to these kind of events and, and what measures you need to put into place and how quickly. Uh, I think when I look at, at our business, what, what will change in the future? And I do think the work, work at home, work in the office relationship will, will probably permanently change to some form of hybrid model where people feel much happier to work from home and maybe split their time. It could be something like two days in the office, three days at home or whatever suits their, 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 their home life, uh, work life balance. And I think employers are going to be much less rigid about allowing that scenario, particularly in British business, it was a mentality before if we couldn't see you in the office, then you couldn't possibly be giving us your all. And uh, I think that mindset will have changed now to, to more flexibility, more adaptability, and maybe a more outcome-based approach to management rather than a, a time-based approach to management of people. Petra, we, we just coming back to your um, Connect with Confidence program, how easy, you know, again, just looking to the future, how easy is it going to be for you, um, you know, as a business to plan ahead, given, you know, we're, we're kind of mid to late April as, as we're recording this and still... There's travel restrictions in place. Business events, you know, are continuing to take place virtually rather than physically. At what point are you going to feel confident yourself? Not not in terms of bringing people back, but actually planning as a business. Yeah, no, and I, I thank you, Russell. And I, I think Mark talked about it a little bit earlier, right? As 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 the countries are open and close and reopen again, I think you know we're going through the same thing uh, across the globe, you know. Uh, we've seen we've seen, we've seen great pickup in in China. Then you had a Chinese New Year where the government restricted a lot of the travel. Then it went down. Now it's back up again. So, so it's it's really really difficult for us to to project the business. Uh, you know, and and some of the states here again open and close and go back. So for us, really, it's the focus is. Uh, you know, on the North Star, which is kind of the Q3, Q4 uh, of this year, where 60% of our meeting uh, planners are telling us uh, they would like to host a meeting towards the end of the year in person. Um, we did recently survey with our uh, top customers, you know, and 27% uh, of them are saying they will host 100 plus attendees in person meeting in the Q3 uh, and Q4. As things are more stable, as more people get vaccinated, so so that's our main focus, you know, and and we're focusing as well on hybrid meetings because hybrid meetings are here to stay. Uh, our customers are telling us that 62% of them will most likely continue after all the restrictions are lifted, so they will host hybrid meetings. So that's that's where we're focusing on, and it, and it is extremely difficult still at this point to protect uh, the business levels. We're focusing on uh, Q Q3 and Q4, and really now go with all the changes and challenges we have as the states and countries are opening and closing at some point. You know, we have a lot of protocols in place. In addition to that, we offer solutions for testing. So if, if the meeting planners wants to test on site, we're offering that as well now. That's to interesting, right. So we have a lots of tools that we, again, as, as Bill mentioned, we evolving, right? We can't stop at one thing. So, you know, we evolving and offering testing and other health protocols for meeting planners that they can implement for their meeting. So I'm optimistic, October, you will be fine, yeah. hopefully. Uh, and if not, you know, we can do hybrid solution. You will have fewer people in the meeting room and the rest can join you virtually. Yeah. Peter, I was going to ask you about testing. Is that something you can foresee going forward that the hotels in general will have uh, a, a testing kit that you test on on arrival, for example, a rapid test? Well, we are not in a testing business. We are in a hotel business. So we, we just want to make sure that we enable our meeting planners to do testing. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, 
a list of vetted vendors that we reference to our meeting planners. So if you want to do in-house testing, if you want to do on-site testing, we can offer all of these vendors. Again, the, the customer or the meeting planner needs to contract with them directly because yeah. in a testing business, but we do it today. Uh, a request for wedding where the bride said, look, can you help me to organize wedding in a hotel? And I would like to test my 150 um, wedding guests in your hotel. So we do it today um, through our partners. So I definitely see some of it coming through, you know, and you see the rise of the, the health passes or health wallets as well. So we're looking into this as well. And that's the next evolution for us. What, how can our meeting planners potentially verify that it has been vaccinated? So that's something that we're looking into now as well. And we, we do that internally right now. We're, we're an essential provider. Most of our uh, people have been vaccinated because we're, we're engaged in healthcare and, and dealing with um, lots of different aspects of business on the decontamination side. But even internally, we, we, if we have meetings, we have tests available. We say to people, please turn up. Um, have a have a t 10 minutes early have a test have a coffee it's part of the part in the part of the preamble nowadays it's a new language it's a new way of working a new way of living and that's that's the key thing new way of living not just being subject to uh, to certain things i mean everybody needs to play the part definitely bill i'm going to let you have the final word on this podcast before i do that i just want to go back to um the conversation that i had with dr tina joshi um because when i finished you know, chatting with her, I also um, asked her if she felt that the widespread use of UVC technology will make people feel more confident and comfortable returning to the workplace. Yes, certainly. Knowing that microorganisms can be rendered ineffective or unable to transmit by using something such as UV C light is, is incredibly important because it can make a difference across a variety of settings. It's not just one setting. I mean, you could use it in gyms, hotels, care homes, offices. It's a big game changer and it should give people the confidence to be able to go back and, and live their lives almost as normal if and when we get out of the pandemic. Uh, Bill, listening to Mark and Petra and from the conversations that you're having with your clients across different sectors, what's the outlook looking like then? Are you, are you positive that we can get people back working uh, safely and confidently? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think um, it's incumbent on businesses in across the world to actually raise standards. Um, and if we do that, then we can do it. There is no silver bullet, as we mentioned earlier. There's no one thing that makes all of this okay. We have got to do lots of many things, which goes towards the process and the, uh, the protocol. And having a robust protocol that people engage with is a key thing, because if you don't have a protocol, but sorry, if you have a protocol, but people don't engage with it, then it's as good as having no protocol. So there is a human factors aspect to all of this. It's about the risk and reward and people knowing that they have a safe environment to work, play and you know, live in is, is you know, the, the end result. So from our point of view, we're seeing a lot of engagement across multiple sectors, hospitality, you know, right the way across from events and the gatherings of people, whether it's at, uh, at one of Mark's um, large fueling um, locations or the manufacturing, et cetera, internationally. Um, but effectively, if we're having a continuum of product as well, we, we actually have products that deals with fast decontamination, very high, high levels of efficacy and validation, self-validating and producing that result. So like a meeting, we go in and we produce a test and say, let's carry on with the meeting. If we've actually decontaminated the room and it's got that verification backed up by science, then yeah, I think we've got a great future. New technology, UVC, huge part to play in it. And I think um, engaging with key, key players and key, uh, key businesses across the world that in, involved with other businesses and people, business to business, business to customer, um, then I think it's uh, an open conversation to have. So yeah, I, I've really enjoyed today hearing Mark's and, and Petter's uh, perspectives coming from those two key areas. We are born in healthcare. Um, and probably 70 to 80% of our business is always going to be in healthcare. But as I said right at the beginning, healthcare is not just delivered in a hospital or a care home. It's actually being delivered 
in the events, in the meetings, at, at work, um, you know, in, in manufacturing. So, yeah, I, I think it's just um, raised people's awareness to ways to do things better and um, slightly differently. Yeah, maybe a little, maybe a little inconvenient, but guess what? You know, we, we got to do it. It's one thing that the human race is good at is adapting. Bill, if, um, if listeners want to find out more about um, Fintz and Tech and all the work you're doing in this space, where, where's the best place for them to go? Well, I mean, it's always the website. It's always our, our, everyone's shop window. So, yes, of course, it's www.fintzandtech.com. And um, we'll, um, we'll happily kind of put you in touch with any of our key partners and, um, and businesses across the world. Excellent. Well, thanks to all of you for joining me online today. So Mark Husband, Petter Raba and Bill Passmore. And of course, thanks to uh, Tina Joshi for her contributions too. Uh, we hope you've got a lot out of this episode. Uh, we'd love to hear any comments you may have on our discussion. If you'd like to contribute, you can do that on our Facebook page, Twitter feed, or our YouTube channel, LinkedIn and Instagram pages. They are all linked from the top of the website at csuitepodcast.com, where you'll also find all our previous shows and supporting show notes plus links to where you can subscribe or follow for automatic downloads of each episode via your favorite podcast app and if you've enjoyed the show please do give us a positive rating and review uh, finally if you'd like to get in touch with us uh, you can do that via the contact form on the website as well or you can connect with me on twitter using at ross goldsmith or you can find me on linkedin but for now thanks for listening and goodbye